So we have an interesting tension in, in uh, morality and ethics. On the one hand, we prize rationality. We always say that we have good reason for our actions. Even if we say, well, I did it just because I wanted to, that's at least a reason, right? Wanting to do it. So we have, we prize rationality in our decisions. That's one thing that we like. The, but the other, what we don't like, however, is that there's a lot of disagreement in ethics. There's a lot of fighting. Right? Uh, and what we'd like to do, what we think is the best solution with disagreements, is we try to give everybody what they want. Right? So kind of a motivation here is to say everybody's rational and everybody gets what they want. A real, you know, kind of, a, kind of a real typical way of trying to do something like this is to deny that there's any uh, objective facts, objective moral facts that apply to everybody. Right. So then there's, so there might be a reason for me to perform an action, but my reason uh, wouldn't be yours because you have different sets of reasons. And the reason why they wouldn't be yours is because there's no objective fact that kind of determines for both of us what we should be doing. Now, uh, this kind of denial of objective facts right, uh, takes two forms in this book. Uh, Rachel's looks at two different kinds. One is just simple subjectivism, and the other is emotivism. Simple subjectivism is the claim that, uh, is, the, is, the, is the idea that all moral claims are really just a claim, claims of approval or disapproval. So I could say uh, honesty is good. And really what that means is uh, I approve of honesty. And I, I could say murder is bad. But what that means is that I, uh, I disapprove of murder. Now, th this uh, theory has some advantages. You know, the advantages, I'm still dealing with truth, okay? So when I'm saying um, honesty is good, and I'm saying I approve of honesty, I've uttered something that's true, okay? Uh, the only way that's false is if I'm lying, maybe. <laughs> um, but as long as I'm being honest, right, my claim that I approve of honesty is, is true. Uh, the, uh, the other advantage that uh, you were, we were talking about at the beginning is that everybody gets what they want, right? Um, and it's, in fact, you know, there's, there's reason involved because we're dealing with truth claims, right? So here's the reasoning. I approve of honesty. So I say honesty is good. And that directs my actions, meaning, uh, you know, here's my reason for being honest because I approve of it, right? I like honesty. I, I feel good about honesty, how, however you want to try to cash that out. Um, it, so we have reason, we have truth claims, but at the same time, um, we don't have to have the disagreement. Because I can say things like, um, you know, uh, being honest to my friends in all situations is good. And what that means is I approve of being honest with my friends in all situations. So somebody else would say, well, I, you know, somebody else can say, I approve of honesty with my friends, but there's sometimes when the truth hurts. Um, you know, and, I, and hurting my friends is bad, meaning I disapprove of hurting my friends. So there'd, be, so there'd be reason in those cases to not tell the truth to your friends. Now, one person's reasons don't need to affect the other. They don't have to disagree. Uh, because all they're talking about is what they approve and disapprove of. So on the surface, it looks like subjectivism gets us what we want. We get reason, we get rationality, but at the same time, we don't have to worry about disagreement. It's a dangerous drop-off over there. We should probably consider that as a warning. So, what we think we've got here with civil subjectivism is uh, something that we really want. We want for people to be able to be guided by reason, but to get everything that they want. Well, in avoiding disagreement, I think we've run into another problem. So, 
if moral claims are going to disagree, right, they have to be contrary, meaning uh, that they both can't be true together. Right? That they both can't be true together. So uh, think about the truth relations that we studied in class. You know, at least one of them is false. Like, okay. Well, when you look at uh, simple subjectivism, it's, you, you know, the moral claims are true, but they're never false. Right? The moral claims are true, but they're never false. Uh, in fact, moral claims can't, contra uh, can't be contrary to each other in this sense. Because the fact that I approve of something has absolutely no impact on the truth value of whether you approve of something. Right? I can say I approve of honesty all the time, in every instance. And you can say, well, I approve of telling my friends the truth most of the time, except in cases when it hurts them. We haven't disagreed. All we've done is express preferences. And we thought that this was an advantage. Well, you know, in throwing away all disagreement in an effort to avoid some, I think we're, we don't understand what we committed ourselves to. In throwing away all disagreement, we've thrown away all disagreement. Right? Simple subjectivism says that people don't ever actually disagree. Well, no, people do disagree. You disagree with others when it comes to moral claims. All right? Pick your favorite hot-button you know, hot controversy issue, pro-life, pro-choice, separation of uh, religion from state, um, uh, um, you know, big business versus small, uh, big business versus, um, you know, independent businesses, you know, big government versus small government, um, same-sex marriage, right? Pick your favorite issue. You disagree with somebody. You really do. You're saying, no, this ought to happen. You're not saying, I approve of this and you approve of something else. And so we're not going to worry about it anymore. No, no, you disagree on what is actually true there. So simple subjectivism has some real problems. And if you, if you don't like those, <laughs> if you don't like those, I guarantee I can start finding examples, right? You think torture is wrong, especially like torture for entertainment. You think that's wrong. It's not merely a matter of preference. Nobody should ever do that. So if, when throwing out um, all disagreement as a way to try to give everybody what, what they want, you know, we forget there are some people where we don't want them to get what they want. We think they shouldn't be doing what they're doing. So this is the problem with uh, simple subjectivism, is that it means that everybody agrees. And quite, clear, quite clearly, everybody does not agree. There's a problem related to this problem of complete agreement. You know, like I said several times, Morality is supposed to be a guide for action. Right? Now, you know, the fact that people approve or disapprove of something is not necessarily a good reason to either do it or not do it. And we do use morality as a basis for, uh, for instance, law. Right? Uh, not always, <laughs> but uh, most of the time. Um, you know, there are lots of things that are, are uh, immoral and legal, and we know they're moral, immoral and they're legal. Uh, but we'll, maybe we'll get into that later. Um, so we think that morality should be a guide for action. It's supposed to guide not only our own lives, but um, be a guide for how we act collectively. But the fact that one particular person or group approves of something, and that's the only reason, is not a guide for action for you to do it or not to do it. Heck, the fact that you approve of something is not necessarily a good reason. So I got news for you. Uh, you have conflicting approvals and disapprovals. Yeah, you do. Um, for instance, um, I know, uh, you know people, who, you know, people who smoke. They approve of feeling good. They approve of pleasure. Uh, but they don't approve of uh, the health or the health problems, right? So you've got conflicting uh, approvals and disapprovals. Right? Um, there, there are other examples. Well, maybe I'll just let you think about it. Maybe you should sit down and think, okay, where do my approvals and disapprovals conflict? Because that's a really good question. 
So a problem here is that uh, you know, if, if we're dealing with approval and disapproval, morality is, uh, you know, approval and disapproval is not a guide for action. And we want our moral claims to be guides for action. Oh. So another dangerous point here. Uh, Simple subjectivism runs into another problem, and it's related to the problem of complete agreement. So remember uh, that we said that uh, one of the things about subjectivism is that you know, it does deal with the truth, right? Uh, but people can't be wrong, they can't be mistaken about what they approve of. So that means that every moral claim is true. We could call this the problem of impeccability. Or sorry, not impeccability, a problem of infallibility. Infallibility. This is the claim that, I mean, subjectivism means that, you know, subjectivism says that, you know, telling the truth is good. That means that I approve of telling the truth. Well, that claim can't be mistaken. Suppose it's different. Suppose I say lying is good, right? Lying is really good because it helps me get money and it gets me the things that I want and I get to make suckers out of other people. And I approve of all of these things. That's why it's good. Or, you know, th that's what it means to say it's good. I approve of all of these things. You very clearly don't agree with that. <laughs> there are, you know, you have said many, many times you're wrong in making that moral claim. You're wrong in thinking, I don't know, like I said, pick your favorite controversial issue. Uh, if that doesn't satisfy you, I can start thinking of examples. You think murder is wrong. Don't sit there and try to think of why you might think murder is okay. If somebody came in and murdered your family, you'd want bloody vengeance. Right? And the reason why is because you think it's wrong that they murdered your family. Right? You don't like that? I can start picking more examples that'll curl your toes. So, this is another problem with simple subjectivism. It implies, that it implies moral infallibility. Nobody's ever incorrect in making their moral claim. Now, simple subjectivism ran into some pretty serious problems, but simple subjectivism is not the only game in town. To try to adapt and overcome those problems, there's emotivism. Now, emotivism is the claim that, that what is moral, uh, you know, the, these moral claims are simply uh, expressions of attitude. Right? They're not even true and false statements. So, you know, with simple subjectivism saying honesty is good, I'm saying I approve of honesty. With emotivism, when I say honesty is good, what I'm saying is, yay, honesty! Woohoo! Well, this, you know, yay, honesty! That's not even something that's true or false. That's, it's not a sentence at all. I mean, it's, it's a sentence, but it's not a declarative at all. There's no predication of a subject. Now, you might be able to form a proposition about you know the truth of that, but that's not what emotion. That's not what moral claims do. It's just this expression of, of an attitude. So this um, uh, this attempts to avoid the problem of disagreement by saying, look, you know what moral language is used for is trying to persuade people, right? and specifically trying to persuade people to take courses of action. Well, uh, there's disagreement in moral discourse because we want people to do different things. Okay, so we so we do get the disagreement, and uh, you avoid the problem of infallibility by claiming that well these just are not claims that are true or false to begin with. Right? These are emotive claims; they're not uh, uh, they're not infallible claims. So this is this is the attempt of again trying to avoid problems of of disagreement. And uh, uh, you know, you know, letting everybody get what they want. Well, emotivism might have gotten us into more of a mess than we realized. So, what's the idea? What's involved with this idea of saying that moral claims are just emotive claims? Well. Remember at the beginning of the video, and this is something that pretty much every class I've ever had agrees upon, is that we want our actions to be guided by reason. We don't want 
actions uh, to be foolish. We don't want them to be irrational. And as the assistant, we want our actions guided by reason. Uh, we, we want our actions guided by what's rational. Well, that means, you know, again, morality is supposed to be uh, guiding our actions. So we want our moral claims to be rational. Right. Well, you know, why, why think this? Why not just go along with impulse? It's like, well, you have goals. Right? You want to do things. At the very least, you want your decisions to be rational uh, because you want your, your actions to achieve those goals. Right? Well, that involves reason. You have to be able to figure out which course of action actually achieves the goals and achieves the goals at the price you're willing to pay. So uh, there's already this notion of rationality as action, involved in our action-guiding uh, uh, claims. Uh, well, that means that we want rationality and morality. All right. Well, if you're dealing with rationality, you're dealing with logic. Uh, logic just is the science of reason. And it's the science of making, making uh, good inferences and uh, uh, avoiding bad inferences. Well, if you're dealing with logic, well, then you're dealing with what's true and what's false. If you're dealing with logic, you're dealing with what's true and what's false. Logic doesn't deal with uh, pure emotional outbursts. So we said emotivism has neither true nor false claims. Right? They're trying to avoid the problem of moral infallibility this way. Uh, emo emotivism is just cheering, you know, expressing, a, uh, a, you know, saying, Yay! Honesty! Uh, but if you deal with logic, you have to deal with claims that say honesty is moral and that that honesty is moral is true. So emotivism fails in this regard. It fails uh, to be rational. And you already expressed this idea. You've expressed this, many, many of my classes have already expressed this idea. And the idea is, well, I, I wish people were logical. I wish they weren't just emotional. I wish they didn't just work on their feelings. Well, guess what? You're rejecting emotivism. You're rejecting emotivism. And kind of on a related note, um, you know, what, what we said before about action guiding, um, other people's emotional outbursts are not necessarily reason to guide your actions. And not, you know, even if they're just your own emotional outbursts, that's not necessarily reason to guide actions. Right? Because you have conflicting emotions about things. You really, really do. That's part of the beauty of being human is that, is that inner conflict. So emotivism itself also runs into this problem. And you know, the big problem with both of them has to deal with truth. Uh, so it looks like you know, we're going to have to deal with this issue about what's true about moral claims, whether we want to or not. And I know we say we want to avoid disagreements. We want people to be able to get what, we want, what they want. But we don't think everybody should get what they want. Well, if we're dealing with something like that, it looks like we're dealing with what's true and what's false. So simple subjectivism and emotivism Probably can't cut it. So up to this point, a really big critique for uh, both simple subjectivism and emotivism is this concern about good reason, and specifically, what we uh, about whether moral claims are true or false. And it looks like we can't escape the idea that moral, moral claims have to either be true or false in order for them to be reasonable at all. And if we can't escape that, well, we're probably uh, going to be committed to, to the claim that we're going to have to disagree with some people at least some of the time. Right? And in fact, you're already committed to this. There are plenty of people that are doing things out in the world which you think they should stop. And in some cases, you think we should force them to stop. Right? Um, so this, so this question then is, well, what's going to count as good moral reason? Now, you might immediately have worries. You know, you might worry, well, uh, that means that I have to listen to somebody else. I'm like, well, in a sense, maybe, but not just because it's that other person, right? It's because, you know, you're not even listening to the person. You're listening to what's true, okay? Uh, presuming we could find what's true. Uh, you, you know, you might have worries that somebody's going to control you using their uh, moral claims. And, 
Well, I mean, you want to do the same thing already. You want to control other people based upon your moral claims. Uh, now, if you just want to claim that you're special and, and all that, well, we'll actually get to that chapter <laughs> later on. Um, the, the simple fact is, is if you're committed to the idea that we should stop people some of the time because of the things that, you're, that they're doing, you have to be open to the idea that you might be one of those people. Now, uh, something else uh, you might worry about is that um, there's like only one way to live your life and uh, or something like this. We should all be one culture. That just doesn't follow at all from any from, from the idea that there's uh, going to be uh, objective moral claims. And, you know, some moral objective, quote unquote, moral objective theories might imply that, but that's just not necessarily the case, right? You know, just look at our own society. If you have any inclination towards the idea that uh, liberty, equality, uh, justice are um, some really strong principles to live behind. Well, there's a lot of ways you can live that out. There's a lot of different ways you can live that out. So, you know, the fact that there's going to be moral claims does not necessitate that you are now never free. Uh, in fact, you know, one of the more ancient views of morality was, was indeed that morality limited your actions, but they made you more free because those were the kinds of actions that actually got you what you wanted. So you might be worried uh, about some kind of objective moral theory uh, having you know some issues <laughs> there. Uh, really, just put those issues on the back burner for the moment. At least try to see what different moral theories say before you start borrowing problems. Now, Rachel uh, hasn't really given us a great idea of what a good moral reason is at this point. We're still wondering. I mean, he's even asking the questions like, what counts as a proof? and ethics. And this is, this is a good question. You know, proof in ethics is not going to look like a proof in the physical sciences. You know, by the way, a proof in the physical sciences is not going to look like a proof in mathematics. A proof in mathematics is not going to look like a proof in history. Uh, a proof in history is not necessarily going to look like a proof in law. Right? So there's already ideas, I mean, the, the, you're already committed to the idea that there are different kinds of proofs. Now you might wonder whether one is better than the other, that's an interesting question, and maybe we'll talk about that in class. Um, and yes, I got something up my sleeve. Um, so this, so the, you know, Rachel's is at least offering something of an idea of what a proof and ethics is going to look like. Well, there, there's one one condition, right? That you have good moral reason for your judgments, your moral judgments, and that these moral reasons can be explained. These good moral reasons can be explained. Now, he tries to go through several examples. Uh, undoubtedly, not all of you liked them, and that's okay. Right? All he's trying to do is provide an example of some kind of value, some kind of principle, and how uh, you're trying to explain how this is actually some kind of good moral principle. The other criterion for a, a uh, proof in ethics is not only do you have to have good reason for your action, but you have to show that there's no good reason for a, con a contrary judgment, right? You have to have good reason for your moral judgment, and there's no good reason for a contrary moral judgment. And that part gets tricky. That part gets tricky real fast. Now, exactly what counts as a good moral reason? That's an interesting question. Rachel still hasn't provided a clear answer as to what that is. And so you might think, well, there's just no such thing as a good moral reason. Well, no, you already think there is. I know you think there is because of what we talked about earlier, right? You want to think that your actions are rational, that your judgments are rational. You even want to think that your judgments are true, even though you don't necessarily want to confront other people with them. <laughs> you know, you're more than willing to say that person's wrong, just so long as you don't have to say it to their, you know, face. <laughs> um, so no, you already are committed to the idea that you have good moral reason. You think that you're being rational. How do I know this? Well, you have lots of moral judgments. Uh, for those of you that have families, you, you think, you believe that the right thing to do is to take care of your family. Why? That why is what you think is a good moral reason. Lots of you have chosen a career. Right? You've chosen to follow a, a certain path, a career. Why? Have you chosen that career? And yeah, that has to do with ethics, right? Morality is supposed to tell you how you are to live your life. It's supposed to be a guide to action. You have certain reasons.
for choosing the career the, the career path that you did for choosing the major the major that you did well that's a moral reason all right um, you have lots of more reasons you uh, you have lots of more moral reasons you have goals right you have uh, ambitions and you don't think that these ambitions and these goals just float out of the air right you don't just go from one ambition to the next the next day you think you should stick with this ambition especially over others you think you should stick with this goal especially over others why that's what you think is your good moral reason All right. again pick your favorite controversial topic you think you're right and you don't think that you're right simply because of an emotional outburst or because of a feeling right you think you have good moral reason why write it down contemplate if the answer doesn't come immediately to you start thinking of why this action is good in comparison to other actions try to find that moral reason it's there you have it so write down that moral reason write down what you think is that good moral reason and we'll talk about that in class.